David uh, for coming on to the co-management conversations podcast. It's really exciting for me and you to be doing this. Uh, I know we've known each other for a long time now. You do have a really interesting story to share and I think it, there's a lot of teachings in it for people that care about co-management and want to work into this field. So let's jump right into it. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jamie, and uh, appreciate you spearheading this podcast idea. I think there's going to be a, a lot of great opportunities to hear from some interesting people in the co-management space. So looking forward to hearing more. Um, yeah, so my name is David Borish. I'm uh, a researcher as well as a filmmaker from Ottawa, Ontario. I think there's and still so much more about you, though, that we need to share, because I know when I first met you, you showed up in Labrador. You were uh, very early on as a PhD student at the time, and it was uh, great to follow along and learn from all the work that you did through that period of time. And I, I know one of the hardest parts of doing a PhD sometimes can be writing your positionality statement and just wondering if you could share a little bit more about what you may have written in that statement and, and how you situate it yourself. So I, I guess for a bit of context there, I, um, I, when I was in my undergrad, I pursued uh, various uh, kind of research opportunities as well as documentary film opportunities in kind of separate ways. Um, you know, I mentioned that I went to Malaysia and worked on documentary film, um, in particular related to the interconnections between tiger conservation and indigenous well-being. Uh, and I also pursued different research opportunities. And after my undergrad, um, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do something along the lines of both kind of qualitative research and filmmaking. And I had this kind of amazing opportunity uh, to work with uh, Drs. Ashley Consolo, and Sherry Lee Harper on this uh, documentary film project in Labrador that was going to be about uh, the effects of declining caribou populations on uh, Inuit communities that relied on these uh, caribou herds for a variety of aspects of their well-being and, and lives. And I, I never intended to do a PhD at all, um, let alone up in kind of that part of Canada. Um, but I kind of just dove right into it and ended up finding myself, you know, a few years after my undergrad, kind of in the middle of this uh, pretty complicated uh, story uh, from both that kind of research as well as filmmaking side. And um, to that point about the, the positionality, Jamie, I, I kind of always um, throughout that process was thinking about, you know, how does how does my own position in this work as someone that is not from Labrador, not Indigenous, um, really no uh, connection on a personal level to caribou, how, how do I fit into this process and, and story and, and what, what can I do uh, to support the kind of sharing of knowledge? And I think I, you know, it was always um, something that I grappled with, but um, I came to really focus in on the ways that I was both connected to this work as well as disconnected from this work and making sure that I was transparent about those connections and disconnections throughout the process. Um, I guess broadly starting with those disconnections, like I mentioned, I not from the region at all, um, really didn't have that kind of deep connection to, to caribou on a cultural level, on a food security level, on, on many levels. I'd never seen a caribou before. And so there were many ways that I was uh, a visitor to this work. Um, but at the same time, you know, there was this interest and, and need for uh, sharing Inuit voices on this uh, conservation issue um, and doing so in a way that really uh, privileged uh, Inuit perspectives in the kind of visual and, and oral way versus just doing it through uh, uh, traditional qualitative approach. And that's a, uh, that's a skill set that I, I brought to the table in this context within wow. Labrador for sharing this story. Um, and it was just important for me to recognize how I was connected through that work. Also knowing that I wasn't going to be the one leading this work. And that was really critical to most of the work that I, I do really, and in particular, 
through that work in, in Labrador with uh, Caribou and Inuit, you know, I, I wasn't the one uh, leading the, the core themes behind this work. I wasn't the one deciding what to share in the story, what not. And that's where the co-create, co-creation aspects of working alongside communities is really, really key, making sure that Inuit at the end of the day are the ones in charge of of leading this representation of their own knowledge and own stories and myself supporting where I can to help get this knowledge out there. I know in co-management, I try uh, and feel that we need to do better and and have more people sort of acknowledge where they're coming from, given that our whole work revolves around consensus and trying to bring people together in dialogue and uh, with all of those kind of different influences and biases that we sometimes have uh, put on the table, it certainly can generate uh, a much better understanding and seeing uh, researchers like yourself now putting so much more care into acknowledging uh, where they're coming from and how they're coming to this work is uh, really refreshing to see. and. I guess on a little bit of the lighter side, are there any sort of stories or anecdotes you might want to share about that work? I know, I know, I've seen a few incidences where uh, some people had to dress you up and keep you warm. But were there any other challenges to showing up in uh, the Arctic and subarctic and trying to do this work? Yeah, I mean, there are so many different uh, experiences and, and stories, I guess, to share, but. Um, I guess really just being an outsider to this whole context, um, there was a lot that I would would miss in in sharing these these stories. And you know, as as a filmmaker, you're you're constantly looking for those unique perspectives and those different angles and um, the different storylines can that can come together through uh, you know a shorter film or a longer film. And um, as as an outsider, it was it was just a huge learning opportunity, not just learning about you know say caribou and and people but just the intricacies of of working in these communities and and learning some of the nuances of how people get around and you know i i was uh, just very very new to all of that but at the same time i think that perspective was in some ways important when you're talking about communicating a story to other people outside of the Arctic or subarctic that also don't know much about this. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, I, I often work with um, like a community coordinator or community filmmakers who can also accompany and uh, support the interview process. And in particular, in, in the Labrador context, worked with Anna Shywalk, who's a community researcher from Rigolet. And we would go back and forth asking questions uh, for people in, in Labrador and some of the questions would be very basic to them, like what do caribou mean to you? And, and when she would ask it, you know, some people would roll their eyes. It's like, well, what do you mean? That's just like an obvious, you don't even need to ask that question. Like everyone knows, but for me to ask that question, it's like, Oh, well, yeah, clearly you're an outsider. You don't know much about this. I'm going to kind of start from scratch. And it's that starting from scratch that is really important for conveying some of these uh, daily realities that people have, just the way that people might ask me, you know, what's it like to live in, you know, Ottawa? It's like, well, what do you mean? Like, I can just talk about the daily realities and it's, it doesn't feel like a big deal. Um, but I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize that there's there's so much knowledge, perspectives, experiences that is valuable and of interest to other people um, when you're just talking about these very uh, daily norms that are important for, in particular, management, conservation of different species. Oh, there are three different types of caribou in uh, this part of the country that are also important to Inuit and all at their different uh, critical stages right now. Uh, really curious to uh, hear from you what you heard through that process because it's an incredibly complicated species to co-manage right now. There's a, a lot of different interests and groups and different types of agreements and jurisdictions. But I just wonder what sort of nuggets or uh, big ideas that really came out to you through talking to hundreds of people, frankly, uh, over that time period about the decline of caribou in Labrador. 
Yeah, I mean, there was there was so much knowledge shared about that relationship. And for for people that might not know within the Labrador context, um, several decades ago in the 1990s, um, one of the biggest caribou herds in the world lived there called the, the George River Caribou Herd. And it numbered somewhere around 800,000 animals. So just an enormous population of caribou and and people were just so so used to going on these these trips and these hunts and having caribou meat as part of their diets and you know this is something that had been going on for for generations and generations and through that kind of hunting and food connection to this animal there's this uh very complex uh kind of cultural social emotional attachment to this animal um through the different um, aspects of preparing for a hunt, being out on the land, eating the food, sharing the food, all these kinds of things. And so, um, but in recent years and recent decades, that that same population of caribou has completely declined. Um, and at least with the George River caribou herd, uh, it's estimated that it's declined by, you know, more uh, around 99%. So just a, a huge, huge drop. And within that context, back in 2013, the government uh, enacted a total hunting ban on caribou, meaning that no one, not even Inuit, are, are legally allowed to hunt caribou anymore. And so that's kind of the, the context there that people for the past decade uh, have not been able to interact with this animal in the same ways that they have. And so when they were talking about caribou, there was just so much emotion in the ways that they um, missed this animal, missed the the kind of relationships, the stories, the experiences that came with interacting with caribou. And so when you, you ask, you know, what are some of these main things that people talked about? Um, I'd say the overarching one, no doubt, is that there's just this massive gap in people's lives um on a food security level you know there it was a staple food and now they don't have that staple food and now there's just this this missing link in the way that people can you know eat um but also this kind of gap in this like cultural practice um being out on the land um this this gap in the way that people see themselves even you know a lot of in particular, uh, hunters said that caribou were part of who they were. It was part of their identities. Um, and now that they can't go out and hunt caribou, you know, what, what does that mean for who they are as people? Um, one other core thing that pretty much everyone talked about was this worry and concern for future generations. Um, you know, we talked to elders and adults who grew up eating caribou, you know, five days a week. And also youth who had never hunted a caribou before, and in some cases had never even seen a caribou before. And so what, what does that mean when you've got this younger population that just doesn't have that same relationship? What does that mean from a stewardship perspective? What does that mean from a cultural continuity perspective? Um, and if the caribou herds do return in the future, which hopefully they will, you know, what does that mean for the future of this relationship between these communities and this animal. And so uh, I'll just say there were so many different things that people talked about across all of Labrador, at least the communities that we visited. Um, but those are some of the main things that stand out. Yeah, interesting. And I know in the co-management world, there's certainly been a lot of literature about uh, when you take an animal like caribou, for example, I think it's fair to say, and a lot of people would agree that the uh, biology and ecology and those type of sciences have been pretty dominant over time in, in how caribou are managed and have certainly have had a lot of influence. And in recent decades, there's been a much bigger pushback against uh, using only that type of knowledge. And I know with your process, having spoken to so many Inuit over a period of time, uh, I'm really curious to get your thoughts on the method that you used uh, in using video and being in that social sciences realm of things and qualitative data. But I'm kind of curious to hear what you think 
you were able to accomplish using video and and those type of methods that we might not have been able to learn in caribou co-management otherwise. Yeah, for sure. So I think, um, I mean, kind of broadly speaking, there is this huge value and in, in need. To, and when you're in the co-management space, you kind of understand it already that local communities just have such value and, and knowledge and wisdom when it comes to understanding um, species and, and the ways that they interact with different wildlife populations. And that knowledge is so fundamental to making decisions around management, uh, and making decisions around stewardship and supporting continued uh, respectful relationships between these communities and these animals. Um, and so there's there's that that need to to understand or at, at least engage with those knowledge systems on that local level. But I think there's kind of been, at least in my view, um, a lot of challenges in trying to properly document that kind of knowledge, um, especially when it's you know cross cultural, um, especially when it might be in you know different languages. Um, and picking up on the nuances of what people are talking about when they are speaking on their relationships and their interactions with species and their their understandings on the ground, their observations. And that's something that, you know, uh, maybe traditional qualitative research can can still do when you're doing, say, interviews with people, you're documenting it, you're, you're writing it down, you're you're publishing it in different reports and all that. And there, there's there's value in that for sure. But I think oftentimes it can miss some of the nuances that come with these knowledge systems that are not written down. They're very much kind of orally shared, orally passed down, visually shared as well. And that's just, I, I think, where film and, and video can play such an integral role in um, documenting this kind of of wisdom and observations. Um, when you're talking about bringing documentary film into that process of understanding local knowledge systems, you know, you're, you're documenting not only what people are saying, but how they're saying it, what they're doing while saying it. People can, can point to things. They can show you out on the land, you know, what they're experiencing, what they're talking about. Um, you're picking up on some of the, the body language. You, you just, you have a lot more, in the research sense, a lot more data to work with, that audiovisual data. Um, and I think when you're trying to communicate that kind of community-based knowledge, that's just a lot more valuable um, for understanding or trying to make meaning out of it. And then, of course, on that kind of communication aspect as well, um, it just makes, I think, a lot of sense to share information about these topics through video. You know, that's around the world, that's the direction that we're moving. People are just interacting with video content uh, a lot more than a lot of text content. And in order to, to kind of keep up with those forms of, of understandings and communication, you know, I think broadly the, the conservation world, the, the research world needs to keep up with that. And, and film can be a really great tool for doing that while also not losing out on that kind of in-depth ability to analyze qualitative knowledge because at the end of the day when you're doing video interviews you're, you're still picking up and and gathering that qualitative information to be able to you know write reports write uh journal articles and whatnot um but you also have this other um opportunity and ability to create um digital uh audio visual outputs from that same content and what was it like uh showing up with a camera i'm kind of curious what people's reaction would be if i saw some guy coming into the northern uh, parking lot on snowmobile, I, I might just run inside and not want to talk to you. What was uh, what was that like, and how did you get through that barrier, I guess? Yeah, I, I'd say I was surprised on how willing people were to be on camera and talk, um, but I think that's for a few different reasons. I mean, if I came in on my own as you know, someone from the South, a complete outsider to these communities and just went up to people and said, hey, you want to talk about this on camera? I think people would be more hesitant. But, um, you know, fundamental to this process, and we can talk more about it is, you know, this co-creation 
um, aspect of, of working with people from communities. And as I mentioned, I, I worked with uh, Ina Shywalk uh, from Rigolet and, you know, she just, she knows so many people in all these communities. And so her reaching out and her connecting with people saying, hey, are you able to, you know, be involved in this film about caribou? That was that automatic link that people, you know, trusted her and knew that this wasn't just some outsider. It was part of a kind of a community-based process for for documenting and sharing these stories. So uh, that that collaboration with local communities, with with people from the region, was just absolutely fundamental to making this work. But I think another reason why people were okay talking about this is because of the nature of the story. You know, people had a lot to say about caribou. People wanted to share their thoughts and their experiences uh and you know people really uh, to my surprise really opened up about their connection to caribou they there was a lot of emotion shared on camera um that i wasn't initially expecting um and you know maybe this would be the case with other animals and species and issues as well but i think there was something about that connection with caribou that people were like we need to talk about this and, you know, now we're we're moving into another broader project, as I mentioned, about um, the uh, connections between communities and polar bears. And I think people also have a lot to share relating to, to this species as well. Great segue. Uh, I used uh, one of your pictures as my background today. Maybe you could uh, tell people a little bit about this picture, what was happening, where were you two, what was going on there? Yeah, so uh, I guess... For a bit of context on that, um, so the the caribou documentary film uh, heard um, that was its own uh, distinct project, Labrador focused, um, and we were we were fairly successful in creating you know a full length film, a, a short length film, various research outputs about this connection between people and caribou, and and after that project, you know there was this this interest and in, and. In, I guess, need for documenting and sharing stories about other human animal relationships in not only Labrador, but other parts of the Eastern Arctic. And, and so uh, it kind of transitioned into this new project that, of course, you know about and you're, you're leading about um, Inuit knowledge and voices relating to polar bears. And I, I think one of the driving factors here is that there there's so much knowledge that's out there in the world about polar bears for many, many reasons. Um, but oftentimes the perspectives of the people that are actually living alongside polar bears is not shared to the same level. And so those those observations, those interactions with bears, that knowledge is, is not engaged with, is not um, understood or is not um, used in a management perspective as much as I think it, it could be, at least according to many community members. And so we've transitioned into this new project um, called Nanook Narratives that is really about trying to use documentary film to make Inuit knowledge more accessible and influential when it comes to polar bear management. Um, and so this photo uh, in your background is uh, a first polar bear uh, hunt and excursion that we went on outside of a Nukchuak in Nunavik, um, where we went on a multi-day, multi-day, uh, yeah, uh, hunt to go find, track a uh, polar bear and uh, really document that experience, document that knowledge on the land. Um, part of this is, of course, also talking with experienced elders and, and people that uh, have these deep connections to polar bears. And you know, we're in these early stages of putting uh, this series of, of short documentaries uh, together, uh, not just in, in Nunavik, not just in Nunatsiavut and Labrador, but across Nunavut and also Greenland as well. So it's, it's going to be, a, I think, a pretty exciting project. Oh, I think so as well. I remember you telling me it was minus 50 temperatures, and I couldn't help but think of the different challenges that may have uh, brought as well. Maybe you could, how do you keep a camera battery warm in in that situation and participate in a polar bear on most people would run from a polar bear so i don't know uh maybe you could give us some insights on what that was like hopefully you weren't a liability to the to the <laughs> harvesters that were out there that we no i you know um 
I, I had been out on the land on different um, excursions and, and film trips um, for the, the caribou work. And we had some, some harder days, but this past winter in, uh, you know, February, 2023, it was probably the most extreme experience I've ever had, especially from a filming perspective. And, um, you know, we, we went out on a, on a multi-day trip that lasted a better part of a week out on actually the background for me, uh, out, you know, on the ice, um, in Hudson's Bay, north of Inichuac. And as you mentioned, you know, it, it was down to minus 40, minus 50 with wind chill in some cases. And that was just extreme weather to, to exist in, <laughs> at least for, for me coming from, from the South. And, you know, I, I've had some cold days in a place like Ottawa, but when it's minus 30, you know, you, you can't really do a whole lot, let alone being out on the ice with, you know, no real access to, to heat outside of, you know, in the evenings we would come back and, you know, uh, stay in a cabin and it would take probably about an hour or so to heat that up before you actually felt like you were, you were comfortable. So it was incredibly intense and, and difficult to, to film in that um, for many reasons. And, maybe just to share a few of them, um, you know, you're, you're on the back of a skidoo. It's, it's bumpy. Um, you can't really have any skin showing at all. And, and even just the idea of like taking my hands out of my seal skin mitts to, to film and be nimble. Like I, in some cases I only had like 30 seconds to a minute before I had to put my fingers back in the seal skin mitts because my hands were just so, so cold and I needed them to be nimble and agile to be able to, press, you know, buttons and press, you know, record. Um, so that in itself was extremely difficult. Um, the the battery issue was for sure a challenge and I really wasn't sure how that was going to go. Um, but what I found was the batteries would just get exhausted so fast in those conditions. And it's not that they would die. Um, it's that they would just um, completely... Um, stop working so you needed to be able to heat them up again to bring them back to life and so in some cases you know i would put a battery in i would film for like 10 15 minutes and what um what could be you know 80 percent of the battery life left um it would just completely get exhausted i had have to put it back into you know a pocket near my body and warm it back up and you know maybe 30 minutes later or so i'd be able to reuse that and so the trick for me was just to have a bunch of batteries on my body at all times and just constantly switching them in and out and also spreading them across our group. You know, we went out on this trip with about eight to 10 people and giving multiple people batteries to keep them by their bodies, to keep them warm was, <laughs> uh, was the trick. So I was probably pretty annoying about it, but constantly asking people like, Oh, I need that battery to be able to, to film again. Um, so those are, you know, some of the conditions, but you know, as I can, probably share with with this uh this visual um you know the camera in those conditions truly froze like it, it was just frosted all over snow was getting into the camera in some cases you know the the record button actually froze so i couldn't press record i couldn't film um so there's all of those kind of challenges of working in these conditions as well that is 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 just hard to to deal with but you know i'm i'm happy and in some ways amazed that the equipment held up and we were able to still capture some some pretty good footage of these conditions of being out on the land and tracking finding polar bears so did you ever get nervous at any point for sure i i think uh probably the most nervous i was was in within the first half an hour to an hour of the trip because i um you know I, I couldn't have any skin showing and I my goggles just kept fogging up. I, I was told by other people to keep breathing downwards and I just couldn't figure out that system. So my goggles were frozen. Um and I also couldn't really hear what people were saying. And that's not just because of the loudness of the skidoos, but you know, people were speaking in in Inuktitut and I don't understand Inuktitut. And of course they would translate here and there, but for the most part, you know, they they kind of just did their their thing and uh, I you know it's not like I wanted them to, to translate all the time but I found myself in an environment where I, I couldn't really see very well I was kind of deaf because I didn't really know what was going on and I was you know tasked with trying to document this whole experience in like minus 40 minus 50 so 
that first half an hour was like, oh my God, like, what did I get myself into? And how the hell are we going to be able to create a film from this? But, uh, you know, I think after the first day or so, kind of eased into it and realized that these people just, they, they know the land so well. They understand the dynamics of, of the ice and the animals and, and the weather so well that I really never, I was never worried about, you know, safety or anything like that. It was just a matter of, you know, how can I deal with being in these conditions? I hear you. We should give a huge shout out to Tommy Palliser, who's the executive director of the Nunavik Marine Region Wildlife Board. And just so people know that certainly none of this work would be would have been possible without uh, their support and the collaboration between three different co-management boards. And I know uh, he was certainly uh, enthusiastic about hosting you and, and wanting uh, to show you all of the knowledge that was held in uh, in his community and and the local men's association, as I understand, were heavily involved as well, and it became uh, quite a community event just to take uh, you out and uh, have the whole process documented. So I'm really excited to to see the videos when they're ready to be shared more broadly, and I think people are going to be quite impressed and or any kind of preliminary reflections you have on, on your uh, past winter and, and things that you can think of that you just would never have imagined or things that maybe ways your mind have shifted about polar bear harvesting now that you've uh, were on three different uh, trips this past winter? Yeah. Yeah. Um... For sure. I mean, there there was so much knowledge already shared in these early stages of this work about that connection and relationship to bears. And, um, you know, I, I, I think growing up in particular in the South, there's this view that hunting certain animals is just kind of off limits. You know, the, even when I bring it up with some, some family and friends that, you know, people still hunt polar bears, um, I think there's there's a lot of different uh, perspectives that go against that. You know, the, that's just an animal that, that you can't hunt. But one thing that, you know, we heard across the communities that we visited, at least in Nunavik and, and Labrador, is that there there is um, an abundance of polar bears um, within these areas. And, you know, I, I can't speak to the, the broader trends across other parts of the Arctic or anything like that, but... Um, there's a lot of people that feel that there's more polar bears in their specific regions than there was, you know, 20 years ago. And there's a variety of different um, implications uh, of that. Um, one of them being the, the safety co concerns that people are, are sharing. Um, and this is in particular in two communities that we went to in Nunavik, uh, Anukchuak and Kangsuolujuak, um, that's more on the Ungava Bay side. And people are saying, you know, it's to be out on the land is is different it's it's more concerning they're not able to you know stay in tent like they did um during the summer or during the winter on caribou hunts you know they have to be very very careful um, because there's more bears in those areas um and so that's that's one of the i guess key takeaways i think from my experience so far is that um there's just that kind of changing dynamic of um, these human polar bear uh, interactions and you know the the exact reasons for for why there's more bears in these in these areas or the density of these bears um, you know that might be something that we explore more through this work through um, hearing more perspectives from communities through these uh, kind of broader discussions between uh, Inuit as well as Western science um, I'm kind of excited to dive more into that but I'd say that's one of the the key takeaways that we've heard um, within the communities we've worked in so far. Yeah, no, excellent. That's really great reflection. And I guess uh, one of the things on my mind as well, you mentioned at the beginning of our chat that you had done documentary film uh, in several different international locations. And I just wonder if there are any similarities or big differences you could point to when using this method 
in the Arctic, for example. I can imagine the temperature is one thing we already covered, but are there are there other nuances? Or- yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. I was kind of reflecting on that the other day on, you know, I've had the privilege of working in very different geographical landscapes from tropical rainforests to, you know, the the, the hills and, and mountain areas of, of Nepal and, and, you know, the Arctic as well. And <laughs> Um, of course, there's there's so many nuances and, and differences within those those regions and the way that people interact with those environments and the wildlife in those areas. But it's also amazing to hear about the kind of cross cutting themes and similarities that many underrepresented communities feel that they have, and one of them is just that there's so many voices of of indigenous peoples and other peoples. Uh, in these areas that they just feel like their knowledge is not recognized. It's not valued. It's not respected. Um, and there's just this this connection, this knowledge that these people have in these areas. And when you're talking about the conservation and, and management of, of wildlife in these ecosystems, you know, you, you cannot disregard the communities that live adjacent or within these ecosystems as well. And so I'd say that having the chance to speak to people in, you know, the rainforests of Malaysia or in, you know, some of the, the mountain areas in Nepal and now the Arctic. Um, a lot of these people just feel like they have these perspectives that are unique because they live there. They, they know kind of what's happening on the ground and they know how that's affecting their own lives and their own well-being. And that just, that needs to be shared, that needs to be understood and needs to be valued. And hopefully that's something that documentary film and that interaction between film and and research can help to support. I believe strongly that you are working at the front lines of something uh, super interesting and powerful. And obviously in the context of using documentary film and really amplifying Inuit voices and using that to sort of cross over into policy worlds and getting messages through to government decision makers that are something that uh, I have a lot of hope for. I, I think that uh, it's going to become influential. So I hope that it, it helps with that problem that you just discussed about people simply not feeling like they're being heard. And uh, that's a, a bad place to be in and very frustrating. And I've heard a lot uh, of perspectives on that from my own work as well. So, uh, yeah, may, maybe I'll just share um, to your point about how, you know, documentary film isn't new. And I, I completely agree with that, obviously. You know, there's so many films out there. There's so many people that have already done films on a variety of these different issues and, and topics. but I think what is changing, or at least hopefully changing with the work that we're doing is that kind of community-led co-creation aspect behind it. And um, it it's not sufficient for someone like myself to go to these communities and, you know, act as like a, a, a helicopter researcher or, or whatnot, where you, a parachute researcher, where you, you come in and you, you just document what you can, you create a story, think that you're doing good or trying to you know tell a story from your own lens like it it really does need to be led by the people that are are the the holders of of this knowledge and these experiences and to do that properly takes a huge amount of of time and and dedication energy resources um and that's something that can be really difficult to to commit to i mean with for example the, the caribou work we did that was a four plus year uh, project of of working with communities. And it was not until I think it was about a year and a half uh, into the project that we started filming for the first time, right? So there's there's so much that happens in that in the film world, the, the pre-production phase that uh, that needs to happen in terms of building those relationships, building that trust, getting a deep understanding of what it really is that people want to be sharing and get out into the world. Um, and also, you know, hopefully building capacity within communities, uh, ideally, and this is something that hopefully we're working towards with the uh, Natuk Narratives project is, uh, there's a lot of capacity already within these communities to create, to create films or at least capture, um, video, 
Um, but also supporting that, building that so that um, it's not just people from the south or people from the outside coming in, documenting polar bears, documenting this knowledge, you know, really supporting local visual media capacity to be able to to do that already and and tell stories in ways that they feel are important to share. So I, I'd say that's that's a kind of a core thing and just want to want to leave it at that. Yeah, that that makes me think of another really interesting question, I think, in that, like, how do you deal with that internal conflict? Or do you even have an internal conflict where on one hand, uh, you may aspire to be the next David Attenborough, and then on the other hand, uh, understanding that it's the Inuit voice and story and perspective that needs to come uh, from this work, and it's not uh necessarily playing to a broader audience and trying to really authentically share a story so that a certain group of people are heard like do you ever have any of those tensions or how do you how do you deal with that yeah i i think um i mean growing up for sure it was always uh looking up to you know people like david atterborough and and other incredible filmmakers that are are doing the majority of the work um, or at least leading a lot of the work. But I think I've come to realize there's this really exciting opportunity to kind of be on the front lines of, of co-creating with different people on productions. And um, there's this kind of, I think, newer concept or wave called uh, impact production where, you know, the goal isn't to create a film. The goal is to create some kind of change and use film to support that change. And that that's really kind of what I, I think my core interest is. Um, and so in the context of, say, this this polar bear work, uh, I'm obviously happy and uh, feel really lucky to be able to go up and, and film and work on these stories. But I think I'm more excited about the opportunity to help to coordinate and, and build this project where we're working with other creatives and other knowledge holders and supporting their their knowledge and insights into these processes um, to make this work, you know, as as accurate and valuable as possible. And that that's something that if if I were to do all this, you know, on my own or completely be leading the creative processes, you know, I think we'd be missing the mark. And and that's not what the end goal is of of this work in terms of making Inuit accessible and influential for polar bear conservation. So at least me personally, I'm, I'm excited about this, uh, this opportunity of, of working with a diverse team um, and supporting Inuit in telling their own stories. You've put such an investment into uh, the herd film as an example with your time and building your own knowledge and skill set. And it's really nice to see how that is sort of transitioned into a new impactful project uh in the same region and it's it's nice uh that's not always the case in research unfortunately sometimes people come and do a project and then life brings them to other places but uh i think uh your work and the impact that's having and the enduring time that you've you now spent in this uh, part of the eastern arctic and subarctic is is paying dividends and i think there's a lot more good things to come so uh, thanks for joining us on this uh, podcast it was a lot of fun and uh, i'd say we'll have more conversations on here in the future sounds good yeah really appreciate you, jamie and uh, excited to hear more perspectives on this podcast and uh yeah thanks again for having me okay take care